Well, hello everyone. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com. And today I want to talk to you about a great little catfish. It's a wonderful community fish. It's a Corydoras, but it's not one of the more common ones. It's Corydoras elegans. So let's take a look and I'll tell you all about them. So here they are, Corydoras elegans. Awesome, awesome little catfish. And when I say little, I mean that. They're, uh, they're not like a pygmy species. They're not like Habrosus or Pygmaeus or uh, is it Hestatus. They're not like those guys. But they are pretty small. They, they don't get much over two inches, which for your average quarry is, you know, on the, on the low side. So one thing that means is you can fit more of them in an aquarium. So it's, it's a little bit of an advantage if, you're, if you have less space, say. Um, now these are really widespread in the Amazon River drainage. They've been found in Peru, in Ecuador, in Brazil. Um, they have a wide distribution and they're highly variable. So there's lots of different color patterns and mixes even within a given population, but you know, especially among different populations. As you can see right there, I, I do keep them with some rainbow fish here. I keep them with a, a breeding group of Wapoga red uh, laser rainbows, the Melitania rubra vitata, and they do great with them. Um, they're like a, just a wonderful little fish. They're, they're, another way they're a little different from most of the Corydoras is if you look at them, you can see that their mouth is a little higher on the head than a lot of the Corys. A lot of the Corys have the mouth way down on the bottom of the head. These guys have a little bit higher, and I'm not sure exactly why they've developed that way, but it coincides with an interesting behavior that they have, which is they tend to swim off the bottom of the aquarium more than a lot of your other species of Corydoras. Now they don't do it all the time, and they don't typically swim at the top of the aquarium or anything like that, but they will get a few inches up off the bottom of the aquarium and swim around. Now in a lot of Corydoras species, when the catfish are you know hovering above the bottom, it can be a sign of illness or that something's wrong. But in this species, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So if you see that, then just know that the species often hangs out above the bottom a little bit and swims around and it's perfectly normal for them. Um, diet on these guys, like any other corridor, they're, um, they eat just about everything. They're an omnivore. They do need a lot of protein in the diet. All corridor species like a lot of protein in their diet. In fact, it's really difficult to breed them without feeding them kind of meaty foods like frozen bloodworms, frozen brine shrimp, uh, some of the rapashi mixes, um, live food, live blackworms, things like that. So they do need more than like algae wafers, say. They're not like a placostomus um, or an, an animal that needs a lot of vegetable content. So do make sure that you give them enough protein in the diet. They will thank you. Now, like other quarries, they are a gregarious bunch of fish. They are perfect citizens in a community aquarium. They don't pick on other fish or anything like that. There have been a few um, reports on the internet that maybe the males are a little aggressive during spawning, but I've never seen anyone really observe that, and I've never observed that in my fish. That comes from, there's a guy in uh, Scotland that raises Corridor's elegance, and he noticed after one of his spawns that the female's dorsal fin was a little bit tattered. So he wondered, when he wrote about that and talked to people about his spawning of the fish, he wondered if that meant that the male had been a little aggressive on her. But the key here is he never saw the aggression. He just noticed a little bit of a tatter on the dorsal fin. So it could have been anything. It could have been while she was racing around the aquarium looking for somewhere to stick her eggs. She caught it on something or scraped it on a filter or got it caught on a filter outlet you know, or inlet, I mean, anything like that. So while there have been reports of that, I've never seen it and I've never talked to anyone who's actually seen it. So maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But my big problem with that, or my big, I guess, question is, if you look at a corridor's mouth, they don't have the dentition to really do damage to other fish. Their, their teeth, the grinding parts of their mouth, are up in the head. They're not out, 
you know, in that protrusion that they use to kind of sense food and feel for food and suck food up. So personally, I don't know how a Corydora's mouth could really hurt another fish. So I'm a little skeptical of it. Um, but, you know, maybe it's true. But just be aware that there are reports of that. Um, and that it's only ever been thought of to happen maybe in spawning situations. Um, like all Corydoras, these guys really do need a, a group. In the wild, Corydoras swim in massive groups, hundreds of fish often, all together. And I know that in the aquarium we can't always do that, but give them a group of six minimum. More is better though. If you can go with a dozen or more, you're going to see some amazing behavior. They're going to feel very comfortable. And it's just, there's something about a big school of Corydoras catfish schooling around an aquarium together and kind of how they all become one big fish <laughs> when they coordinate at times that's really magical and it's natural for them. So please never get these fish in ones or twos. Please get a group. Um, and I'm, I'm, wherever you get them, I'm not saying that as a salesman to try to move them. I mean it. It's in their nature to be in a big shoal, a big group. Um, and they'll just feel so much more comfortable if that happens and they'll be so much less stressed out that their health will be better and they'll be out and about and you'll enjoy them more and they will enjoy life more. So just to put it out there, I feel like that's the right way to keep them. Um, they will eat just about anything. I talked about the high protein requirements of their diet, um, but they'll, they'll eat just about anything. Flakes, um, tablets, wafers, uh, rapashi. In fact, that's what they're eating here. That's what all those little white bits are on the bottom of the aquarium. They've kind of been working on a piece of rapashi I put in there and breaking it apart. Um, but they'll eat anything. They're not hard to feed. Do feed them directly though. One thing that happens sometimes with corridors in our aquariums is we uh, just kind of count on them being able to get enough food just by scavenging, scavenging, <laughs> I don't know why I can't say that word, scavenging across the bottom. And that's not really the case. We need to actually purposely feed them and get food down there so that they can eat enough because these fish really do eat a lot of food. Compared to, to most fish, they can eat a lot of food and they need it because they're a high energy fish. They're constantly moving around searching for food. They burn a lot of energy and in order for them to grow or, or to spawn, get in spawning condition, they really do need to be fed well. So please always make sure to directly feed your catfish, especially your Corydoras. Uh, pick a food that goes down to the bottom where they can get at it before all the other fish have eaten it all. If, if all you feed is flakes or floating pellets, things like that, they're going to be in rough shape. And you won't notice it for a long time because they're so hardy and because of how they're, they're armored, they have these uh, really massive skeletal structures in the head, so they're not going to shrink in the head. And then they have these really rigid armor plates across the body, so it, it's really hard to notice when they're not getting enough food. But I promise you, for not feeding them directly, they're, they're probably not doing well, and in the long run, they're, they're going to have major, major problems. And often you won't notice it until it's, it's really, really severe. So anyway, enough about that, I suppose, but just do feed them well. Um, now, this is a species where there is some uh, sexual dimorphism here. Males and females are a little bit different, so that that one that just went across the back, let's see if I can find a female here for you. So that's a female right there that just swam off. They're a little duller than the males, not quite as much color contrast, a little browner. Um, they get a little larger and a little fatter than the males. Now it's not a stark contrast like you get in killifish where it's like the males are brilliant, bright red, bright orange, you know, bright yellow, shiny blues, and the females are just brown with a couple little dots on them. It's not like that. But you can more or less tell the sexes. So the ones with the, the most bold black markings are the males, and that one like up at the top there, that's a female. So that's kind of neat because a lot of corridor species, you can't sex them. Just like any other corridor species though, if you want to sex them, 
I assume it's because you're trying to breed them. So that's a female and two males right there that just swam off. Um, I assume it's because you want to breed them. And just like other species of corridors, they, they breed really well in groups. So if you want to breed the fish, get a group. Get at least six or eight. More would be better. Um, and a ratio of two males to one female is often recommended, but once you get into a group of eight or more, it doesn't matter as much. You're gonna have enough of both sexes to take care of business. Um, just like other quarries, they lay the eggs on the glass or they place them on plants, um, and you can collect them and artificially incubate them, or you can remove the parents from the tank and incubate them that way. But one thing about quarries is as soon as their babies hatch, unless you have really, really dense cover in there across the bottom for the babies to hide in, as soon as the eggs hatch, they're probably going to get eaten. In fact, sometimes they'll eat the eggs before they hatch. So you do need to separate them. Um, but this is a fish that you can definitely breed in the home aquarium for sure. Um, temperature wise, I keep like most of my fish here, I keep them in the mid 70s, about 75 degrees or so is what they're at. They can take it down a little lower, up a little higher, anywhere from say 73 up to 78, maybe a little warmer. But they do come from um, forest streams generally in the Amazon River Basin. So they come from, you know, shaded areas where even though it's warm, it's probably not super hot in their environment because there's a lot of shade blocking that sunlight from shining on them. Um, the setup I have them in is very simple, like most of my tanks. It's a box filter that has some filter floss in it to, to remove uh, you know, some of the particulates from the water column, and then a sponge filter for biological filtration. And that's, that's it. Um, they, they do fine on a bare bottom tank. Just keep, it, just keep it the water quality clean. Like all fish, they need clean water, by which I mean no ammonia, and no nitrite and keep the nitrate down as much as you can. Uh, coming from streams they're used to pretty clean water that's flowing and um, is, is constantly circulated so that's a good thing to keep in mind. All right I hope you liked that info about Corridor's Elegans. Wonderful little catfish, pretty cool, pretty diverse little guys. Um, do good in any community tank, really. Um, if you have any questions about this species or any comments about them, please post them down below. Whoop. Ah, I can never do that. Yeah, there it is, down below. And um, we'll get a geeky discussion about fish going. All right, talk to you later. Bye.